The opening of the air war over the Pacific was brutal. Allied pilots found themselves fighting an enemy whose fighters appeared to be able to run rings around their own. The most notable of these Japanese fighters was the Mitsubishi A6M, more commonly known to Allied pilots as the Zero. Designed by a team headed by Jiro Honkoshi, the A6M was designed for the Imperial Japanese Navy and as such could be operated from aircraft carriers. At the time, most carrier-based fighters had to sacrifice some aspect of performance to make it suitable for the rigors of carrier operations. But what made the Zero so feared was that for the first time, this aircraft had performance which could match most of its land-based adversaries, something almost completely lost on Allied intelligence prior to December 1941. The Zero was a fast slasher, being capable of high speed and great agility. By contrast, most Allied fighters, such as the US Navy's Grumman F-4F Wildcat, were much heavier designs as they incorporated greater protection, something the Zero sacrificed to achieve its stellar performance. Therefore, it was quickly realized that what was needed was a more powerful fighter, which could match the Zero's performance without sacrificing the protection and firepower afforded to the US pilots. This led to the development of one of the greatest fighters of World War II, the Grumman F-6F Hellcat. Welcome to Wars of the World. Even before Pearl Harbor, the US Navy was looking for a new fighter to replace the Wildcat, and once again, the Grumman Corporation won a contract for a prototype, dubbed the XF-6F-1, this being signed on June 30th, 1941. Designed under the company mantra of make it strong, make it work, and make it simple, the XF-6F-1 shared a familial resemblance to the F-4F but was almost a wholly new machine, being powered by a 1,700 horsepower Wright R2600 twin cyclone, two row 14 cylinder engine. The thicker wing was also mounted lower down and could be folded back either manually or hydraulically, reducing the amount of space the aircraft took up when being stored in the cramped confines of an aircraft carrier. Compared to the F4F, the XF6F-1 also had a much wider landing gear, which was mechanically folded into the wings, unlike the earlier aircraft where the pilot had to laboriously crank a handle to deploy or retract them. As well as easing the physical burden on the pilot, this arrangement also made the new aircraft far more stable when coming back aboard an aircraft carrier. Development of the new fighter was already well underway when the Japanese struck Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. Given the effectiveness of the Japanese Zeros in the early engagements, the US Navy's Bureau of Aeronautics began working far more closely with Grumman to tailor the XF-6F to meet this deadly foe. Eventually, some of the US Navy's early aces, such as Lieutenant Commander Butch O'Hare, found themselves being interviewed by the Grumman engineers and asked of their opinion on how the new aircraft was taking shape. The experiences passed on to Grumman saw several changes made to the design which would have a marked impact on the final aircraft. Finally, the Bureau of Aeronautics feared that the R2600 wouldn't be able to provide the power necessary to match the Zeros, and so instructed Grumman to begin working on replacing it with the 18-cylinder Pratt & Whitney R2800 Double Wasp, which offered an additional 300 horsepower. Pilots such as O'Hare also directed Grumman to raise the position of the cockpit and increase the slope on the forward fuselage towards the engine cowling to give increased all-round visibility. The resulting fighter was a brute compared to the Zero, being blessed with a higher top speed yet retaining the high level of protection for the pilot, such as a bullet-resistant windscreen and armor around key areas, while at the same time it could also dish out the punishment with a trio of 50 caliber M2-AN Browning machine guns in each wing, a configuration that was becoming the standard in American fighters. Later, the capacity of up to 2,000 pounds of ground attack ordnance, such as bombs and unguided rockets was also included, these being carried under the wings or on a central hardpoint which could also be utilized to carry a 150-gallon external fuel tank to increase the range. 
The first prototype was still powered by the original twin cyclone engine and took to the air for the first time on June 26, 1942, followed by the first flight of the double WASP-powered variant just over a month later on June 30th. By October of that year, Grumman was ready to begin production, with the Navy assigning these aircraft the designation F6F-3, but the aircraft was yet to have a name. Given its familial resemblance to the F4F, it was initially referred to as the Super Wildcat, but Grumman disliked this term as it implied it was little more than a beefed up version of the earlier aircraft. Interestingly, a name that found favor with many was the Tomcat, a name a later Grumman aircraft would immortalize in the case of the F-14, but they felt this was too risque for the US public in 1942 since it had a sexual undertone. In the end, it was company founder Roy Grumman who bestowed a name on it, that on the one hand recognized the contribution of his company's earlier aircraft, which had fought bitterly in those earlier months, while at the same time invoking a degree of profanity that inspired its pilots with aggression and confidence. And thus, the Hellcat was christened. As production F6F-3s began rolling off the assembly lines in October 1942, a new training regime was devised for the aircraft, taking into account its handling characteristics and its benefits and drawbacks in combat against the Zero. In the latter instance, US Navy instructors were greatly helped by the capture and testing of an intact Mitsubishi A6 M20 in the Aleutian Islands after it was hit by defensive fire from a US Navy Catalina flying boat, its pilot, 19-year-old Tadayoshi Koga, dying in the subsequent crash on the island of Akutan. Compared to the F6F, the Zero still held an edge in maneuverability, particularly in turn rate. Pilots reported that the Hellcat was extremely stable in the longitudinal axis, which helped a great deal when bringing the aircraft back aboard a carrier, but except at higher speeds, this advantage left the aircraft rather sluggish in a turn. Therefore, F6F pilots focused on using their higher speeds to pick and choose when they engaged the Zero, making sure they always held the advantage and avoiding slow speed dogfights. This wasn't helped by the aircraft feeling rather heavy in the controls. The first US Navy squadron to re-equip with the F6F was VF-9 in February 1943, flying from the carrier the USS Essex under the banner of Carrier Air Group 9. Over the coming months, more and more of the F4Fs were replaced by Hellcats as the US Navy built up its strength on the type, until finally on September 1st, 1943, the new naval fighter was able to unleash its guns in anger. Two F6Fs from VF-9, piloted by Lieutenant Junior Richard L. Loesch and Ensign A.W. Nyquist, flying from the USS Princeton, were vectored towards a Japanese Kawanishi H-8K Emily, long-range flying boat snooping on US activity on Baker Island, halfway between Hawaii and Australia. The two US flyers attacked head-on, riddling the flying boat with bullets, which proceeded to descend towards the sea in a lazy 180 turn before hitting the water. As well as being the first victory for the Hellcat, Loesch also earned the accolade of being the first pilot to score a kill in both of Grumman's cats. Within days, two more Emilies would fall to the guns of the Hellcat. However, the Hellcat wasn't intended to simply shoot down lumbering flying boats. It was designed to fight Zeros, and it got its first chance on October 5th, 1943. Task Force 14 were ordered to launch a series of strikes on Japanese-occupied Wake Island over a period of 48 hours to reduce Japanese strength there. Taking off before sunrise and in poor weather, several aircraft missed their rendezvous, but 47 Hellcats led the charge against the island's Japanese defenders, who put up 27 zeros in response. Lieutenant M.C. Hoffman and Ensign Robert W. Duncan of VF-5 were the first to engage the zeros. Duncan spotted several enemy aircraft in formation before initiating his attack. Singling out one of the Zeros, he poured 50 caliber rounds into his victim's cockpit and engine, watching it glow brightly in the darkened skies it caught fire. Duncan had no time to celebrate, for it was then he saw an enemy fighter turning onto the tail of one of his squadron mates. Duncan attacked, forcing the Japanese fighter to break off and enter into a loop with his Hellcat close behind. As both fighters hung seemingly motionless for a second as they went over the top, Duncan spotted an opportunity and fired, sending another Zero burning into the sea below. The Hellcat was now firmly in the fight, and using its great speed and firepower, was quickly dominating the skies over the Pacific. But the Hellcat's finest hour was yet to arrive. In 
In June 1944, while much of the world's attention was focused on the Allied invasion of Normandy, the US Navy in the Pacific was preparing to undertake Operation Forager as part of the effort to expel Japanese forces from the Marianas Island chain. Once this was achieved, the islands could then be used to launch B-29 Super Fortress raids against the Japanese home islands themselves, in preparation for the expected invasion of Japan itself. Spearheading the operation was the US Navy's 5th Fleet, and as the operation got underway with airstrikes against Saipan on June 11th, news came down that the Japanese mobile fleet was en route to intercept the American force, thus setting the stage for the largest carrier battle in history. The Japanese mobile fleet, under the command of Vice Admiral Jisoburo Ozawa, consisted of nine carriers, three fleet carriers and six smaller escort carriers. On board were some 437 aircraft, most of which were A6 M2 Zeros, which had to double as bombers. Facing this force was Vice Admiral Mark A. Mitcher's Task Force 58, with 15 carriers, seven fleet carriers and eight escorts, and these embarked 873 aircraft almost half of which were Hellcats. Even with support from land-based aircraft, the Japanese forces were at a significant disadvantage, but as they were now fighting to protect their home islands, they would do anything to stop the advance of the Americans. At 0550 hours on the morning of June 19th, a Mitsubishi Zero spotted the American fleet and radioed back its position instigating the battle. The Zero was shot down by defensive fire from the fleet before the Hellcats could intercept it but now both sides were alerted to the presence of the other. A short while after, Japanese aircraft began taking off from a rote field in Guam with orders to attack the Americans. However, US radar picket ships detected the force forming up and 30 Hellcats were dispatched from USS Belau Wood to intercept them. The Hellcats arrived as the Japanese were still taking off and in a pattern that would repeat itself throughout the day, the Hellcats set upon them and massacred the Zeros. Even with the arrival of reinforcements, the Japanese pilots were totally outclassed, losing 35 of their number for just one Hellcat being shot down. Throughout the course of the day, Japanese pilots bravely launched four major attacks against the US fleet, but their effectiveness was almost completely nullified by the stubby-looking Grumman fighters. Over the span of a few chaotic hours, US Navy fighter pilots downed 380 Japanese aircraft, such was the dominance of the F-6F that they accounted for 368 of them, losing only 30 of their own number. Recounting the day's events during a debrief aboard the carrier USS Lexington, fighter pilot Lieutenant Junior Grade Ziegel Ziggy Neff fell back on his rural Missouri roots as he recounted his tale of downing four Japanese aircraft that it was, quote, just like an old-time turkey shoot, end quote. Thus, the air portion of what is remembered as the Battle of Philippine Sea will be embedded in the memories of all who fought it as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. With the Hellcat controlling the skies, US bomber and torpedo aircraft, as well as submarines, were able to inflict a great deal of punishment on the Japanese fleet, largely unmolested by Japanese aircraft. During the battle, two of Japan's precious fleet carriers were sunk, including the Shokaku, which had participated in the raid on Pearl Harbor, as well as one escort carrier. Nearly 3,000 Japanese service personnel were killed for the loss of just 109 Americans. It was an unparalleled victory, and one that secured the Hellcat a place as one of history's great fighters, but the war was far from over. Not resting on their laurels, the engineers at Grumman continued to work feverishly to improve their already superlative Hellcat. Despite the Hellcat's performance against the once-feared Zero, Allied intelligence was already aware of the existence of newer, more powerful Japanese fighters either already in service or in development. The Kawanishi N1K, known to the Allies by the codename George, had already proven to be a match for the F6F-3. But fortunately, production of the aircraft fell short of what Japan needed, although this did prove that Japanese engineers were still able to produce competent fighters if given the resources. The F-6F was also being used in the European theater, where it found itself at a significant speed disadvantage when compared to German land-based fighters such as the Messerschmitt Bf-109K and Folkwolf 190D, both of which had a maximum speed in excess of 400 miles per hour. The first major improvements came in the form of the F-6F-5 variant, which featured a more powerful R-2800 10W engine, housed in a slightly more streamlined engine cowling. 
to address complaints regarding the heavy controls. Spring-loaded control tabs were fitted on the ailerons, while the cockpit received an improved clear-view windscreen with a flat armoured glass front panel offering a superior field of view and protection. The rear fuselage was also strengthened, and the wings were redesigned to offer the option of replacing two of the 650 cal machine guns with two M2 20mm cannons, although most retained their proven 650 cal configuration. The F6F-5 would prove the most numerous of all Hellcat variants, with 7,870 being built. From the start of its operational career, the Hellcat was also slated for use in the role as a night fighter. 18 F6F-3s were converted to utilize the ANAPS-410 radar in a pod mounted on a rack beneath the right wing, with a small radar scope fitted in the middle of the main instrument panel. Later, the definitive F6F-3N Night Fighter was adopted in 1943, fitted with an ANAPS-6 radar set in the fuselage, minus the antenna dish, which sat in a bulbous fairing mounted on the leading edge of the outer right wing. About 200 F6F-3Ns were built before production switched to modified F6F-5s, and they claimed their first victories in November 1943. They also saw use in nocturnal attacks on Japanese shipping, and unlike their day fighter counterparts, made use of the 20mm cannons for added punch. Later, Grumman proposed the ultimate Hellcat in the form of the XF6F-6, which came powered by 18-cylinder, 2,100 horsepower Pratt & Whitney R2800 18W engine, which would have catapulted the Hellcat to 417 miles per hour. However, the war ended before production could begin. Towards the end of the war, Hellcat pilots found themselves increasingly involved in providing close air support for US troops, who were going ashore during the final stages of the island hopping campaign. They also found themselves having to fend off the terrifying threats from the kamikazes. Hellcats also served on Allied carriers, such as that of the Royal Navy, while after the war, French Hellcats saw extensive use in the fighter-bomber role in the war for Indochina, the prelude to the Vietnam War. Undeniably, the Hellcat was a major factor in Allied victory in the Pacific. However, in the years that followed the war, its success seems to have been reassessed. The US Navy and Marines were also fielding the awesomely powerful Vought F4U Corsair, which was every bit the match of its land-based counterparts. However, it wasn't as comfortable on the cramped US carrier decks as the F6F, so the Grumman fighter was often the preferred type from a practical standpoint. Although the kamikaze threat saw more Corsairs on the deck, both types have their supporters for the title of Best Naval Fighter of World War II. Also, by the time Hellcats entered the fray in 1943, the war situation had already turned, and Japan had lost many of its best pilots in battles, such as that at Midway, their replacements being given ineffective, streamlined training courses just to get them into the fight. Furthermore, shortages in resources meant that Japan was unable to build more competent fighters in large numbers, meaning the Hellcat was primarily fighting older versions of the Zero, and these factors played a major role in its extraordinarily high success rate. On the other side of the argument, however, those were the aircraft which the Hellcat was tailored to fight, and its pilots were trained to tangle with. Therefore, whether it can be considered truly one of the great aircraft of history is like other candidates for the title, just down to personal choice. What is certain without question, though, is that over the Philippine Sea in June 1944, it was the right aircraft at the right time to bring victory for the Allies. <laughs>